So I am um, Thomas Lamarche. Uh, I am um, assistant professor here, uh, University Paris Diderot, and uh, vice uh, director of the LADIS, um, a French laboratory uh, dealing with um, economy, society, territories, um, institutional change. Um, and I will speak today about CSR. Uh, I'm working on CSR since uh, maybe 10 years. Um, and CSR has changed. Um, and the question uh, today is how can CSR contribute to sustainable development? Uh, Mesoeconomic perspectives. Um, a great, maybe two great questions. But uh, David, tell me you are well, one of the best students all over the world. So I think I can uh, have a big question. Maybe too big to have uh, quite a real response. Uh, but, and I will stress some um, perspectives about what could be a mesoeconomic analysis. So not really huge transformation of the uh, mode of regulation. Uh, I am um, a chief editor of the Revue de la Régulation, Regulation Review, so my topic will be quite regulationist. Um, I think, I will, uh, I will stress that, I think there is no, we, we cannot talk about uh, the transformation of the um, regulation mode or mode of regulation uh, as you want. Um, but it is not only transformation at the level of the firms. It is not a microeconomic, microeconomic uh, problem or topic. And what I will stress with you, to you, is um, about mesoeconomic perspective or institutional changes. Global value chain, firms, territory, sector, and so on. So, uh, three points for today. Uh, the first, a, dy a dynamic base at the macro microeconomic scale. <coughs> it is not my topic, it is what is said in the literature, CSR its firms. Second, I will stress uh, two TLZ facts. Uh, it's a framework to um, understand CSR uh, with two notions, two concepts, uh, my concept, <laughs> I will be uh, glad to hear your, uh, your discussion. Uh, institute, there is two, two concepts which dealing one with one another, uh, institutional CSR and strategic CSR. Third, some reflection about the transformation of the mode of regulation and the transformation of neoliberalism and I will uh, defend the idea that there is not a huge transformation. Um, CSR do not uh, deal with sustainable development but uh, deal with a reinforcement of neoliberalism. Okay? First, CSR should be understood as a dynamic, as a long-term dynamic. The first, uh, the first slide um, is about um, an historical perspectives proposed by uh, Capron and Petit. Vous avez vu? Ils ont vu Capron et Petit, non? Petit. You know Petit. And Capron is uh, one of the, is the French Pope uh, on CSR. Um, in, the, in, the Revue la, in the Revue de la Régulation, uh, they wrote uh, an excellent paper. Um, and they say there is three phases or stage uh, of uh, CSR after World War II. Uh, the first stage is a stage uh, we could so in uh, North America and um, in United States of America, um, and it's a moral moral stage. Um, 
is based on the ethics of company AIDS. Um, it is quite uh, North American, something like a WASP um, uh, dynamic uh, manager, uh, dominating manager with a moral principle. Uh, but the uh, institutional transformation is quite weak, quite invisible. But if you uh, have a look at the evolution of the firms in the long term, uh, we can say that in this uh, stage, uh, firms are quite um, managerial and not financial financialized. First stage. And uh, there is a book, uh, quite important book uh, for CSR, the book of Howard Bowens, um, Social Responsibility of the Businessman. I think the title is quite useful. Um, Second, uh, second stage, um, uh, as say uh, Capron and Petit, uh, a stage more utilitarian or utilitarian. Uh, during the 70s, 80s, 90s, I think there is a turn during the 90s, um, CSR or what we could say about CSR now, because uh, the word CSR uh, is not quite uh, used in the 60s, hey, even five 50s, and uh, for instance, uh, 70s and uh, 90s, um, it's quite utilitarian. The company's social behavior was supposed to serve the, its, its economic performance. Um, Something we, we, we will uh, we'll stress with uh, we'll stress with um, uh, Porter and um, uh, month. We'll see <laughs> uh, with Porter, uh, which is quite important uh, even in the third stage. Since uh, Rio, since Rio, uh, 1992, uh, with uh, sustainable sustainable development principle, um, CSR begin to be, is said to be um, uh, uh, sustainable, sustainability principle, sustainability policy, uh, sustainability firm policy. Um, and it, uh, it has been developed under a huge pressure for public criticism. Uh, then, now, um, firm says, uh, huge firm says, that uh, CSR deals with uh, sustainable development. It's why my, my title is, uh, how can CSR contribute to sustainable development? If huge, big firms says uh, CSR contribute to sustainable development. Okay? Uh, okay, don't. I, I, I'll say now it's a dynamic, but it's dynamic um, which uh, um, which is not really organized. There is a, a weak standardization. We cannot say there is no standardization. There is a, an institutional process. But now there is not really something like a standardization. There is something like a standardization de facto, um, uh, but not de jure. The law is not the first. Um, um, the law is not the first uh, organizational process for CSR. CSR is led by something like an uh, institutional isomorphism. You know DiMaggio and Powell? DiMaggio and Powell in the great paper, um, The Iron Cage uh, Revisited, um, uh, discuss uh, the process of mimetism. Um, and mimetism not as a s only as a strategy, but mimetism as um, the modality of acting for people or for manager when they are in the same institutional situation. 
very interesting, but it's not my topic. When I were, <laughs> I should. Um, CSR is structured by a lot of practices and private rules in competition. It's very important to have this point uh, in mind. Uh, CSR begins with practices at the firm levels, and firm produce some rules, uh, but uncoercitive rules, private rules. Well, private rules could be uh, very strong, but it's not hard law, it's something as a soft law. Uh, there is a, a full of definition of uh, CSR at the firm levels, by charts, code of conducts, uh, at the CSO or non-governmental level, as global compact and so on, at, the, at the something like a global level, with, uh, C with the normalization ISO um, 26000, I will explain just after in another slide. At the governmental or intergovernmental level, we could stress with uh, Jean-Pierre Chanteau in another paper in the uh, Revue de la Régulation, um, that the, the process of definition, the struggle to define CSR um, is a part of the conflict about CSR. And it's quite um, interesting for, for us to see how to define CSR. Um, is uh, hard law, is soft law, is coercitive, is non coercitive, or uh, what are the frontier of uh, CSR? Quite a struggle. Um, two definitions, first uh, European Commission and uh, ISO uh, 26000. Uh, according to European Union, CSR is defined, it's, it's, it's just a definition, um, is defined as a responsibility of the enterprise for their impact on society. Quite fuzzy, quite huge, but great ideas, of course. Um, comment tu dis on peut pas acheter le bébé avec l'eau du bain? <laughs> tu dis pas. <laughs> no, no joke, no joke in English for me. Um, CSR is increasing, increasingly important to the competitiveness of enterprises. It can bring benefit in terms of risk management. I will, I will speak about risks uh, just, af just after. Cost savings, access to capital, customer relationship human resource management, and innovation capacity. So you, uh, European Union said to the firms, ah, it's good for you. Ah, we need you. Um, the commission encourages that enterprise should have in place a process to integrate, should have, should have, oh, it could be a very good idea, um, to integrate social, environmental, ethical, human rights, and consumer concern into their business operation and core strategy in close collaboration, should have in close collaboration, you read, uh, with their stakeholders. Which stakeholders? To be discussed. To be discussed by who? By the firms. Uh, ISO 26000. Uh, social responsibility, it's uh, a standard. ISO 26000 has been a very big process, very, very big process. Um, four years discussion, multi-stakeholder approach involving experts from uh, uh, 19 countries, 40 international or broadly based regional organizations involved in different aspects of social responsibility. Great process. Uh, the objective of social responsibility is to contribute to social, to sustainable development. Very important. Yes, we have a standard about sustainable development. Uh, but by encouraging, not coercion, not, not rules, not hard law, encouraging business and other organizations to practice social responsibility to improve their impact on their workers, their natural environments, and their communities. ISO 26000, this international standard in the, in, the, in the standard is not a management system standard. It is not 
intended or appropriate for certification purposes or regulatory or contractual uses. A very, very weak standard, you see? Any offer to certify or claims to be certified to ISO 26000 will be a misinterpretation of the intent and purpose and the misuse of these international standards. As this international standard does not contain requirements and any such certification will be, will, up, would not be a demonstration of conformity with this international standard. So, I have finished with the definition. Uh, but you can see in that uh, two or three slides uh, that uh, the standard, uh, the standard um, provide guidelines, uh, but not requirements, not law, not obligation. It cannot be certified, unlike other uh, ISO, ISO, I don't know, ISO standards, and it cannot be labelized. It's quite important. So, an institutional is uh, the, um, a process of institutional institutionalization, but not a standard. So, it's a dynamic, a global dynamic, ISO, European Union, but um, the definition said everything has to be done at the firm level. For the, for the historical <coughs> perspective, we, we have to say that the CSR practices and discourses always focused on the firm level. Um, so, I, I, I said it. Uh, after being a moral or ethical individual concern, CSR is first a business of communicators during the 90s or the, um, the decades, the 2000, uh, the two kilo decades, uh, uh, it's a business of, of communication, of communicators uh, with annual report, with charters, um, with a lot of declaration. Then uh, it begins to be an accountability task, because if you have to uh, to write an annual report, a CSR annual report, you, you have to, to deal with something with uh, uh, an accountability uh, development. So, communication, then accountability, then organization. So, there is a, a process of transformation inside firms. Um, CSR is derived from a voluntary and declarative logic. All the definition, all the definition said CSR is a voluntary principle. The firm should do, the firm could do, it could be a good idea, ta, 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 ta. Voluntary and declarative. The firms have to say, I do this, I do that, I will do, and so on. Um, so the way the ways and the means of CSR are not legally enforceable. The only country all over the world we, which have some laws with, uh, which are coercitive is France. Um, CSR deal with public interest or uh, firm are saying they deal with great notion with political notion, with public interest, big public policy topics, but do not deal with legal constraints. And we could say, we could conclude that CSR does not really deal with externality. Negative externalities are not integrated in their business models. So, just some example, one example. A dynamic strongly based on affirmation. It's a, it's a campaign, um, uh, just last year, new brand baseline and global corporate advertising campaign for Total makes things better for Total. Okay? Uh, what about Nigeria? What about Birmania? What about. Uh, so no problem. Total could say that. Uh, we would see it's not as simple as that. Three, CSR acting as a political necessity is my topic now. 
first time definition. Now, what I can say about that? Um, CSA I is uh, a political necessity. I think a political necessity of financialized, financialized regime, regime of accumulation, uh, to face new risks. The first point is that there is a, a double demand addressed to CSR, addressed to firms, and addressed to CSR, firstly to firms, of course, to set response to two difficulties. The first, a lot of, uh, a lot of colleagues uh, uh, think that is the, the, the much more important uh, origin of, uh, of CSR, it's the ecological criticism. It, uh, uh, what uh, F. Chiapello um, developed. Um, have you read The uh, New Spirit of Capitalism? Uh, it's a French book, but uh, you could read it in English, of course. Um, uh, wrote by uh, Luc Boltanski and F. Chapello. It's quite important for uh, social science, I think. And the topic is uh, the criticism as change. During the 90-page, uh, 900 pages in, in uh, two seconds. Okay, um, New Spirit of Capitalism. Capitalism had the ability to, um, to capt its criticism. And uh, uh, Chiapello and Boltonski say that uh, during the 60s, no, 50s and 60s, the most important criticism is uh, social criticism about wages, uh, employment condition. And there is a, a social turn during the 70s uh, to the artist critic. Um, the critic addressed to capitalism is uh, we want more creativity, we want more freedom in work. So there is uh, an important transformation of management. Now, nowadays, say F. Chiapello, there is a new criticism, uh, an ecological criticism about the uh, ecological uh, uh, perspective. The, um, okay. uh, so ecological criticism and for the firms, a legitimacy risk. The firms are confronted to a legitimacy problems. Uh, ecological criticism has assumed a central position, notably because of its capacity of attracting the media and the political figures. There are some new players, not quite strong, but which could be strong sometime. Uh, new players, NGOs, consumer organizations, and the consumer actors. It's a major topic. The second topic is that CSR responds to a, a cri crisis of shareholder governance. It's developed in Zingales, it's developed by Rubinstein, and so on. Um, and the the, uh, the problem that big firms have to, uh, to, to deal uh, with is uh, a risk about control, about control of uh, the capital. Um, and the separation of ownership and control creates a problem of agency between salary top manager and shareholders. I will stress that after. Then we could say there is an institutional institutionalization process, the famous paper of Baudet and Lamarche. Um, so I say there is uh, an important uh, topic with risks. We could say that CSR is a risk management. Um, with, uh, with Porter, um, uh, we could, uh, we could uh, so three risks. Uh, and three strategies. Uh, first, historically is the first, uh, a defensive strategy. Defensive strategy, firms talk to opinion, talk to people, talk to consumer, um, and their responses, it's a responses um, to pressure, 
to uh, critics about their irresponsibility, pollution, human rights, um, uh, ch children uh, working, um, environmental damage. So for the firms, it's a risk on reputation. Huge risk for the firms which have uh, trend important trademarks. A contestation risk. An example. You know uh, the the Lego, okay? You know the Lego. Um, in uh, 2014, Lego has should stop its partnership with Shell after uh, the Greenpeace campaign. Not a Greenpeace, a Greenpeace campaign against uh, Lego practices, but against uh, shell practices with a video, huge video, uh, showing Arctic flow covered of oil. Greenpeace fight again drilling um, on uh, Arctic. If you want to see the video, but uh, not now, I think. Uh, so the pressure on Lego broke the partnership. You see the, the sort of, uh, of campaign. Another, uh, another campaign. Another campaign. Another campaign. Uh, campaign against Samsung. You know Samsung, of course. Uh, in France, a complaint against Samsung for, not for their practices on uh, China, Birmania, etc. In China, for instance. For deceptive marketing practices. Uh, Peuple Solidaire, Sherpa, CGT uh, uh, have uh, developed a trial. First time, the Samsung CSR report assert no children working in our uh, factory. Samsung developed partnership about working condition, ethics of business, safety of worker, uh, uh, develop an external control, but and say in the in the. Um, uh, CSR report, no child working, it's, everything is under control. China, um, China Labor Watch with a lot of uh, NGOs in France, uh, in France, uh, Peuple Solidaire, uh, develop a strategy in two steps. First steps, produce the in original information, so China Labor Watch, so another reality, China Labor Watch in the factory in uh, Wizu, found a list of uh, more than 10 children under 16 years working for Samsung in another factory. Only one visit permits to identify minor working without contracts, 11 hours a day, and so on. Uh, so the control made by Samsung is uh, unreliable. Um, the, second, the second step of the strategy is to develop campaign, public campaign, and uh, trial. Two steps quite different. Huh? And for the moment, uh, there is no legal liability. I will speak about the link, liability, responsibility, which is uh, quite important for us. Uh, there is no legal liability for the company, but there is an ethical responsibility for the firm. Not quite important. I have a Samsung. No, you have oh, it's not, not quite good. Apple, not quite good, is producing Foxconn, you know, a lot of suicide. I do you know you have suicide in the end? No. No problem. No, it's not my problem. <laughs> not for you. For me, it's the same. Uh, OK? But quite a responsibility, not liability. I think that this is a new nexus, a new nexus with uh, CSO, with consumer. Um, but we have to, to characterize this new nexus. I spoke about uh, the risk. You see, uh, the risk of contestation for Samsung. Okay, my one is it's broken, but it's not uh, not linked to CSR. Um, defensive strategy, building competitive advantage, another steps stage. Um, building market and competitivity, seeking for competitive niche. The risk. 
here is a market risk, classical market risk. Um, CSI is a good innovation or not? Uh, uh, could the CSR permit access to new markets or not? Just a market, uh, market risk. It's important, but it's not really new. Um, it's about quality standards. And the third, uh, the third risks are the third strategies. You know, it's risk and strategies here. Uh, something like a um, proactive um, strategy. It's action on the rules. I think it's quite important and specific. The strategy is the strategy to define the roles, the parameters, and the nature of the soft law on the roles, parameter, and nature of the firm. So the process of definition is linked to a strategy of big firms uh, to define what is their CSR. Uh, it's to f the risk strategy is the risk facing the risk of new constraining hard law, uh, very important for uh, um, ecological or environmental uh, topics, and co-producing the new standards. Okay. So, um, alors, so, um, first dia diagram. A micro process, a micro process corresponding to the player decentralized, decentralized action under pressure from the macro regime. There is something like a macroeconomic regime. It could be very, uh, very long to, uh, to develop. So I will, I will not develop, but I will say. Context, global competition, flexibilization of wage labor nexus, crisis of soci social states, which deal or which produce a very important movement for us, which is financialization of firms. And that is the movement that I will develop now. Uh, Transformation of social criticism, as, say, as Chiapello said, development of ecological criticism, and something like a very important turn, uh, destabilization of Fordian social compromise. Then new soft law arrangements uh, arrive. There is a link between the two movements, which I think uh, could explain the institutional process. And there is some defensive responses, in the first time defensive, and after um, strategic, and after proactive, three, st three stages. Defensive responses of firms uh, to the event. To the event is a, a critical uh, um, action, um, uh, oil, uh, oil accident, uh, and so on. Okay? So, Two development, development on uh, the institutional uh, side, which produce legitimation for the firm, which is very important for trademarks for in material capital, and in the strategic level, uh, seeking for competitive advantage. I will deal with that, with that just in the other slide. And there is a movement um, between the, the two uh, uh, components and. This development give a place to act for new stakeholders, for NGOs, for gatekeepers, agency, uh, for uh, the assessment, and so on. Okay? In the context of neoliberal regulation, the development, developing criticism amplified the event shaping crisis at micro level. The company size upon them, thus giving weight to this criticism and creating the CSR dynamics. This raises the question of the effect of institutional forms. Uh, it's a, a regulationist concept, uh, I will stress that uh, just after. And the uh, financialization of the companies. Okay. First. Second. Tu me donnes deux heures, finalement? No, no, je sais. So, um, 
Second, two stylized facts, two concepts, two slides for two concepts. I think there is two notions or two um, reality, uh, two stylized facts, um, which have to be uh, understood. The first, the first in the historically, and the first in the conceptual uh, arrangement. It's something that I uh, name institutional CSR. The institutional CSR is linked to the ability of institutional dispositive to make sense. Um, institutional dispositive, code of conduct, chart, annual report, and so on. It's quite large, but it's rules, something like rules, private or public. And to institute, weakly or strongly, to institute the political dynamics of CSR. Understand. Political do not mean public. I spoke about politics at the firm level, or at the sectoral level, or at the national level. There is something like uh, uh, politics or policies. Institutional CSR produce or make possible, makes possible new compromise. Understand, compromise is not something like an agreement, it's something like a social compromise. Struggle, difficulties, and after with uh, institutional development, there is something like a stabilization of the struggle. Uh, you know the development about uh, uh, the nexus. It's, I, I spoke about CSR as a nexus. Um, these compromises are often weak because uh, they are reversible, very reversible. The, one of the major uh, firms on CSR during the uh, 10 years ago, uh, ST Microelectronics, you know, components, electronic components, uh, deal with uh, very, very good strategy on the CSR. And after difficulties on the markets, CSR disappear, nearly disappear. Uh, so it's quite reversible. Nevertheless, institutional CSR produce some new rules between actors, rules which are dominated by the violence of competition. So, with violence of competition, it's quite reversible. The, the aims of institutional CSR is to produce institution dispositives to face risks and to produce legitimacy for the firms and to produce power, power inside global value chain or inside the firms. Institutional CSR provides the condition to the development of new responsibility inside the production process. It's a question of power, but the reality could uh, have two sides, two faces. Second, the first uh, still is a uh, fact, institutional CSR. The second is strategic CSR. Strategic CSR is linked to the productive size. Institutional CSR is the policy side, and uh, CS, uh, strategic CSR is linked to the productive size. It's quite a um, regulationist uh, framework. Uh, you know, um, do you know um, the book of uh, Robert Boyer and Michel Fressenet uh, about the productive model? Uh, little, little French book, but it's now in English, Italian, and so on. Um, and he deal with uh, something like uh, there is some productive models inside firms, uh, in automotive, and, so and he deal with two, two styles of fact, policy and economics, and it's quite the same framework. Uh, but, uh, strategic CSA associate profit strategies and seeking for competitive advantage as uh, Porter and Kramer, ah, Kramer, uh, um, 2006. This dynamic supposes the creation by actors of new quality convention, another, another conceptual notion quite important, uh, how conventional is uh, created, um, 
new quality convention in terms of responsibility. I assert that there is no child working for this uh, mobile. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, could be, it could be a quality convention, but for the moment, no. Um, or not a quite strong convention. And these new quality convention uh, have to meet new consumers. Strategic CSR development creates new instruments of interfront governance in the global value chain as code of conduct, as some, uh, someone knows. Um, the institutional CSR legitimates these new economic rules, uh, uh, a dialectic, you see, it's a, it's a dialectic movement. Rules which are produced by and for strategic CSR. So, nearly the same, but, but, but not, quite, not quite the same uh, diagram. Reinforcement rather than modification of the finance, financialized mode of regulation. Okay, a mode of regulation, financialized neoliberal regime. Uh, it's something as a macroeconomic condition of feasibility of CSR. And at the mesoeconomic levels, there is something that I call mesoeconomic regulations. The levels are global value chains, networks, networks of firms, territories, national territories, but not only national territories. It could be supranational or infranational on sectors. In some cases, sector is um, the main level uh, of the emergence, emergence of mesoeconomic regulation. So there is two conceptual notions or two stylized facts. Institutional CSR with formal and informal private and public institutional mechanism which permits and stabilize the strategic CSR, organization of production, profit strategy, product policy. And the question is how the dispositive, the institutional CSR, permits, stabilize, make possible the strategies. Because without strategies, there is no CSR. There is just discourses, just communication. And how strategy engenders and requires and legitimates the dispositives. So we have a framework to, uh, to deal with CSR, to, to go uh, watching CSR in uh, the countries, uh, sectors, and so on. OK? Third. It will be good. Um, CSR and evolution of neoliberalism, weak transformation, but a new nexus. CSR, weak social transformation. You see, it's my purpose. It's not quite an objective topic, but it's not a. One of the, one of the problem or one of the difficulties when you are dealing with CSR is that there is a, a lot of firms. There is a, a varied types of firms. And CSR couldn't be the same thing uh, inside financialized firms, managerial firms, partnership firms. It's maybe uh, Riberio spoke of that, about that yesterday, no? OK. Or family firms. <laughs> um, so it's not quite the, s the same um, sociological or economical uh, topic or object. Um, it's quite a difficulty for us because when someone says CSR, another says CSR, but they, don't, they do not speak about the same thing. Um, I think about CSR, there is a weak social and Unperennial compromise. Uh, 
And maybe one explanation of these uh, difficulties or specificities um, could be uh, found in Duménil and Lévy. You know Duménil and Lévy? If you want to venir, do they come? Duménil and Lévy. Um, we wrote a magnificent book, um, Crisis of Neoliberalism, quite a hard book. Um, and the, they said that there is a, they spoke about the power of the compromise between stockholder and manager. And they deal with the idea of the transformation of the compromise, which was a compromise between manager and workers during the 60s, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, maybe 80s. And the social term, the neoliberalism term, is the transformation of the compromise. A big new deal. Uh, and the big new deal uh, could be seen with uh, the eyes uh, of Thomas Piketty with um, uh, repartition of revenue and patrimonies. OK, I could not de develop. Um, third. This leads uh, to the hypothesis, uh, the hypothesis uh, of the emergence of a new conception of control. Do you know Flickstein? Je vais arrêter de poser des questions. Hein. Uh, Flickstein um, has wrote a book about the archi architecture of markets and developed um, an historical view of capitalism with this notion, conception of control and deal with uh, what has been the conception of control during the 20th century. Great, great idea. And uh, um, after the domination of the shareholder uh, value stage, it, it's difficult to say after because we are inside, you know. We, we, are, we are trying to deal with uh, what will become. Um, CSR may be a way of supporting shareholder governance and overcoming its main contradiction. So, don't make a mistake. Flickstein do, no, do not deal with CSR, but Lamarche, me, <laughs> and Rubinstein um, work with this notion, with quite a strong notion of uh, uh, conception and control. And we have named this new conception of control which could be seen in some firms, in some sectors, uh, shareholder value, CSR compatible conception. So quite a, um, a compromise with shareholder value and uh, CSR requirement. Okay? So, um, so I think uh, changing conception of control in the 20th century, uh, you will see in my slide, um, I will uh, give you. Just two minutes here. Uh, so it's from Flickstein first, and after Rubinstein and Weinstein, um, evolution of the conception of control, conception of control, control of the firms. Huh? Okay. The deal, the, the purpose is how a firm is controlled. By who, by which uh, dynamic, by which arrangement, uh, and so on. Four stages during the 20th century. Uh, first, manufacturing conception, 1910, 1920. Industry, and the efficiency criterion is productivity. OK, I think no problem. Second stage, second stage, the emergence of marketing. Now, um, uh, Flickstein say um, before World War, I, World War I. Between World War, I, it's difficult to me. Uh, um, World War I and World War II, 
emergence of marketing, marketing and sales conception, uh, increasing sales, uh, increasing market share, uh, economies of scale, of varieties, differentiation, and so on. 1950s, 1950s, finance conception, emergence of large group, uh, relation finance industry begins to be central in the compromise, domination of national level, huge multinational firms, but at, at the national level. The efficiency criterion is the profitability of capital. It's quite original. It's not the same thing that everyone says. Huh? Uh, fourth stage is shareholder, shareholder value conception, uh, 1990s, and uh, uh, 2000. Shareholder value conception, groups of large company, globalized financial markets, institutional investor. The point, the efficiency criterion is a shareholder value. Uh, and a lot of dispositive, the st uh, strategical dispositive, like a relation, leverage effect, and so on. What we stress, Marianne Rubinstein and I, on, and I, is there is uh, a new stage. There is something like a new stage, um, which is a shareholder value CSR compatible conception something new, something uncertain, but uh, we try to understand the present. Uh, gr group of large companies, globalized financial markets, institutional investors, oh, it's quite the same. Uh, monopoly rent, increasing value of the company's intangible asset, very important intangible asset, and strengthening of property rights, oh, it's quite the same. And shareholder value plus ongoing development of social value. I think here, you see, we are uh, questioning what is the deal between manager and shareholder, and what is the deal with manager and other stakeholder, NGOs, states, and so on. So our uh, topic is to uh, understand the, com the new compromise but very difficult to, uh, to see new compromise because uh, the strength of uh, institution, financial institution, is uh, so huge. Uh, up. Um, ten minutes? Um, <laughs> shall I speak about <laughs> sustainable development? <laughs> Our uh, sustainable development, you know, sustainable development is, is quite a huge principle, Brundtland, uh, future generation, every know, everyone knows that. Um, if, if I have in one hand Brundtland, principle, new generation, in another hand, uh, new mode of regulation, what is a mode of regulation? The, de de the definition of uh, Robert Boyer, a mode of regulation establish a set of procedure and individual and collective behavior patterns which must simultaneously reproduce social relation, very important, through the conjunction of institutional forms which are historically determined and supported by the current accumulation regime. Quite a strong notion. Furthermore, uh, furthermore a mode of regulation ensures a compatibility of a set of decentralized decision without requiring agenting to internalize the principle of governing the overall dynamic of the system. So, wow, 10 minutes, I just say wow. It's okay, I think it's uh, in French, in English, it's the same. Um, what about the sustainable accumulation regime? Okay, definitely. Defin definition of accumulation regime. Accumulation regime, Robert Boyer, of course, dynamic compatibility between production, income distribution, 
on generation of demand. You see, if we want to have a uh, re response on the question, do CSR contribute to sustainable development? We have to work with that and with this. And accumulation regime, organization of the production, temporal view which permits emergence of new business models and business principles, rule of distribution of value, evolution of social demand. That is quite just it's my reintroduction. Now, now I will uh, I will begin to, to speak. Uh, I have to deal. What yes, I could could be. Uh, what I can say here, there, there, and there. I could say something. I could. I couldn't say nothing. It's just financial light. No, CSA deal with some new organization of production, but uh, in struggle with uh, financialization. Rule of distribution of value, oh my god, rule of distribution of value, oh, it's, it's financialized, it's, uh, CSR, do not deal with that. Huh? In Danone, you know Danone, yogurt, um, in Danone, uh, manager, uh, uh, the remuneration of manager deal with finance and ecological and uh, societal principle. Hmm, sometimes it deal a bit. Uh, a lot of good questions to be developed. Um, and the question is, which links between uh, CSR and sustainable development? My topic is, there is new mechanisms, there is new rules, new routines, new routines about responsibility, uh, which are produced by large firms, um, new institutions as code of conduct, chart, guideline, GRF, uh, guideline as a GRFI, Balpacuer, Vercher, uh, and so on. Uh, these institutions are weak according to sustainable development. We have to say it's weak. Uh, uh, they are not functioning as strong rules. They are at symmetrics. There is no really a priority, priority uh, between a social, ecological, and an economic principle. But, but, if I, if I just finish here, you just can say, what are you talking about? But these institutions are not totally irreversible. There is a, a transformation. There is an institutional transformation. Because these institutions could be caught and used by states, by NGO, by unions. Oh my god, I forgot unions. By unions, by managers. Sur CSR is uh, a struggle or a nexus among different stakeholders, but some of the stakeholders are not institutionalized. Unions in Europe, uh, for instance, but uh, not only, are, have a place in the, in the negotiation with states and firms, but NGO, not the same, not the same institutionalization. So CSR produces an institutionalization process. The lack of legal definition of firms, as opposite to companies, uh, attenuates its legal responsibility. It's a very important topic. CSR product legitimacy for firms, for trademarks, but not liability. It's the point of the CSR to deal with legitimacy and responsibility, but to avoid liability and legal constraints. CSR is a question of power. Big firms produce new instruments and new nexus appears, but the stakeholders are fragmented, weak, and so on. So um, one of the main topics is the complexification of the global value chain and the um, the role of CSR inside the global value chain as a recomposition of firms. So CSR struggle on nexus among purpose of corporation. Purpose, production purpose, profit, um, legitimacy, identity. CSR um, firms are not um, univoc. Two minutes. Two minutes, hola, my God. 
Um, so uh, I couldn't speak a lot about the quality convention, but one major topics, CSR strategy will work if the consumer responds to this proposition. So what about this, this, this convention? Uh, what is the possibility to uh, develop new convention when uh, the, um, uh, the, the salaries uh, is so weak? So I think, unfortunately, this convention are uncertain, unperennial, are in competition. So for instance, the CSR is used by firm to develop their power. Just one minute, one big minute, but one minute, um, for the last uh, diagram. Uh, institutional and strategic CSR interaction, micro interplay behind macro structure. So, macro level macro level, uh, mode of regulation, institutional form, accumulation regime. The big question we have to deal with is how uh, the transformation of that categories, that macro category, <coughs> how it evolve. My topic is the evolution of the macro level uh, uh, the, the evolution of the macro level came from mesoeconomics levels. Varieties of mesoeconomic regulation. But one topic is what could be the roles of CSR? The central point is social criticism. Because without social criticism, no CSR nexus. And three question, regulatory, regulatory potential of CSR, is CSR produce rules, what kind of rules, and with institutional CSR, it could affect the institutional forms, but weakly. So, the so wage labor nexus is not really uh, transformed by CSR, but we could we could not say is no transformation. Second question, what about the quality convention on responsibility? And if quality convention, some quality convention could be developed on fine uh, consumer, then strategic CSR could be possible. I just speak about uh, an unknown future. I speak about a lot of realities, uh, some product in some countries. So there is some um, uh, weak uh, uh, signal. Uh, so quality convention affect the accumulation regime, but the accumulation regime uh, stay uh, financialized. Uh, and CSR has uh, a, uh, a tool of uh, power inside firms and inside global value chain. So it deals with uh, the power of the powerful. So as we could say very simply, CSR is a, a tool for the powerful, but it's also a tool for NGOs, for citizens, for consumers, and uh, we have to uh, deal with the, the type of movement, with a crisis which are uh, pr sometimes produced by the NGOs, are sometimes produced by the accident, um, like in the Rana Plaza uh, building in Dhaka, um, and so on. So I maybe will stop now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Professor Lamarch, for your presentation on CSR. And we are going to discuss your paper, Does CSR Contribute to Sustainable Development, which was written by you and by Catherine Baudet. Hi.
And just a quick overview of your paper. You will introduce an analysis of CRR, CSR in the world today. And you utilize the regulation approach to describe uh, your findings in CSR. And you provide us the basis on how it is structured and implications CSR has on several players, as you uh, mentioned here. Uh, and you conclude and you finalize your findings that CSR depends on widespread standards, standards that can be uh, introduced by institutional CSR, which works uh, together with the strategic CSR. But without them, it is impossible to think that CSR plays a central role within labor relations and support a stable macroeconomic system. So, uh, in social terms, CSR formulation represents a regression in terms of working labor nexus, WLN. So this is mainly your conclusions on your paper. Uh, so, to begin your article, you develop the idea that CSR issue provides a general appreciation of sustainable development, considering the overall concepts going back to the 80s, without addressing the specific question of the growth which was presented by Professor Duran, Cedric Duran, mm -hmm. and Le Gilles in 2013. So this mm -hmm. aspect is not uh, being tackled in the article. Uh, you debate, the, uh, in your paper you debate is again based on the regular regulation approach and you emphasize the characterization of the dominant regime that is still in place and the regulation establishes a link between economic structures and social forms in force. Uh, key points. Professor Lamarche questions whether CSR as a cell of sustainable development contributes to increasing ecological and social responsibility among corporations. That's a question. And a doubt that CSR has really uh, plays a, uh, an important role in this aspect. Major concern is the codification of social relations. Company level assumes increased prerogatives and liberties. They are free to establish uh, the rules, the codes of conduct, and this does not come in uh, most of the cases from the top politics that are involved uh, in CSR uh, business. Reasons for CSR to represent ecological and social responsibility are based on challenging of the core institutions of the working labor nexus and the codification of the relationship to the environment greater autonomy to companies. So companies, again, they are free to establish their own set of rules and to practice uh, accord, to practice and produce the way they think it is more appropriate. And also, CSR is a process of disinstitutionalization of the working labor nexus. Mm -hmm. uh, we do believe that CSR is a way out and a corporate component of sustainable development according to several views that are expressed. However, despite all the research and theories found, would it be able to change or even challenge the neoliberal regulation approach and build a logic for sustainable development? This is the major question of uh, Professor Lamarche's paper. And to a certain extent, is CSR capable of transforming capitalist regulation? Uh, then he starts, and the professor has already made his point here. Uh, he starts his paper by using the definition by Capron and Petit that CSR may be presented in three dimensions or three phases. The first one started after the World War II, and it was related more with individual, uh, individual actions. So it was related to some moral aspects and even religious, but it was not uh, an institutional matter. 
was just something more private individual. Then the second phase from the 70s to the 90s, then it has changed to be more utilitarian. Uh, social behavior is supposed to serve its economic performance. So the, the, the major concern now is focus on the economic principles. And then in the third phase, after the Rio summit in 92, then comes uh, uh, a preoccupation of sustainability. And this comes because there is a pressure of NGOs and criticism, public criticism to introduce some uh, uh, mechanisms to develop CSR in light of the sustainability and development. As the professor uh, has already pointed out here, there are two major functions, the institutional CSR and the strategic CSR. And the first one has a political nature. It is something that has to be developed in uh, above the spheres of the companies. It has to be, uh, let's say, laws that uh, laws or rules that can be applied by the, uh, the companies, but they do not have too much power, <coughs> so they are weak to make uh, the real point. Then, institutional CSR. Uh, is it is a political necessity for the financializing growth regime. According to regulation approach, the growth regime assumed a mainly financialized dimension. Uh, it fits into the deregulation process. It has to do with liberalization of financial markets, increasing labor market flexibility, privatization of public service. Surge in reaction to social and ecological criticisms, percept perceptible deterioration of social and environment conditions, and CSR is independent, operates far from public rules, promote commitments that are private, voluntary, and non-binding. So this is all uh, related to the uh, wills and wishes of the companies to develop the best approaches to face uh, sustainable development and CSR uh, thinkings. The strategic CSR is, has been also presented by the professor. It is based on the logic of production, so it has to do with the companies and developed itself by means of the schemes promoted by each uh, institutional CSR. So institutional CSR ha gives grounds to strategic and strategic uh, establishes the set of rules and produces results uh, in conjunction with institutional CSR. May be understood as the concretization of the principles promoted by institutional within the production sphere and has also a conclusion that the strategic CSR does not offer a way out to financialize the growth regime. In terms, it helps strengthen it even when new production practices are achieved. Okay. Um, I think the paper does do a great job in showing how much dominant power uh, these firms have in organizing corporate social responsibility. Um, <coughs> but there is a a diminution of power on the suppliers for each uh, global supply chain. And uh, the paper is very much so focused on the multinational firms, uh, and it does not take too much account into the uh, other economic actors that would be involved with uh, the process of corporate social responsibility. And uh, one specific economic actor that I want to highlight are NGOs, because NGOs uh, could act as watchdogs to the actions that uh, these companies take. And I actually want to provide you with an example uh, proposed in a paper by Rémi Parmentier. I don't know if you know him. Uh, but he outlines the effectiveness of uh, Greenpeace in uh, tracking down te uh, chemical companies that have a habit of dumping uh, chemical waste into the North Sea, which is you know, the part of Northern Europe that connects the Scandinavian countries with uh, the UK and all of that. 
uh, and a lot of chemical companies have, have done a lot of uh, industrial waste dumping there, and that's obviously not good for the biodiversity that's there. Uh, Greenpeace actually caught uh, Bayer AG, I think it's a German chemical company, one of the largest in Europe, uh, and basically, you know, they threatened Bayer AG in that they should organize a new method of uh, dumping these wastes, and the, then the chemical companies that are often involved with these activities organize themselves together in a form of a coalition that represents co uh, social, corporate social responsibility. And basically they come up with a new initiative of dumping waste on land and using a technique that uh, doesn't allow the uh, chemicals to seep out into biodiversity, which is obviously not the case with oceans. So I think uh, the paper should have focused a little bit more on NGO activity and how they are watchdogs and how they could be very useful in uh, actually making corporate social responsibility effective in promoting environmental, social, and economic uh, practices. Um, also, there is a lack of, of uh, explaining how corporate social responsibility is used in sectoral levels. Uh, you give a general framework of multinational firms and how they use their global value change, uh, chains, and this could be attributed to a, a bunch of sectors. But it would be really interesting to see how uh, the electronic sector organizes itself with corporate social responsibility in relation to the energy sector or um, you know, raw materials. And just see, I mean, there will be definitely a, a difference in terms of how corporate social responsibility uh, coalitions are organized and how the rules are set up. So it would be really nice to see how these different sectors operate. Um, also, you focus too much on production, the production stage of, uh, of um, corporate activity. And I think that there's a lot of other different uh, activities that corporate social responsibility could be effective with. And I'd like to focus on waste management because uh, obviously companies have a terrible habit of kind of ignoring the products that they produce in terms of you know, figuring out a proper waste uh, management system. And uh, for example, electronic sector is huge. Uh, the e-waste is profound. And a lot of the e-waste gets shipped from, for example, the United States to this little town called Giyu, China. And it's a huge environmental disaster. So perhaps corporate social responsibility could be used as a way for companies to manage their waste <coughs> within the United States, within the regulations that are, that are uh, imposed by the government. And some companies are taking initiative. Uh, for example, Apple. Uh, with a meeting with Samsung and uh, other different companies. Uh, they have started their own e-waste management system within the United States, and that is obviously preventing all the e-waste going into China, which is obviously misused and creating lots of problems. But this is an interesting uh, topic to focus on, and I wish the paper had a little bit more of that. Um, and then, of course, you focus on the global value chains of, of uh, multinational firms. But there is no emphasis on the multinational firms that don't have a global value change. And I, okay, I will try to speed up as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And I focus on, you know, uh, raw materials. The, com the major firms that deal with raw materials, for example, Bananas, uh, Chiquita, Dole, all of these companies, they don't really have a global value chain. And CSR could be used in a different manner in tracking down the farmers that are in the places where bananas grow and figuring out how they can grow their fruits uh, sustainably and uh, put an investment on the land to make sure that they can produce uh, products year after year after year and generate a good income. Uh, now, um, I'm going to be very brief here. Uh, I wish there was a little bit more information on the, the rules and principles and standards that are, are dealt with in these uh, multinational firm coalitions or, you know, basically what standards and principles are imposed and seeing what specifically is one more effective hour. than other. I have just one hour. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but it's, I'm talking no, about no, the no. paper, not your yeah, presentation. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a joke. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, so having a, just a really strong uh, analysis on what these rules are, what do they consist of, I think would provide a very helpful outlook on how CSR could be used effectively. And also, there's nothing on transparency, which is kind of a very, very important factor of CSR, because uh, when these uh, rules and principles and standards are brought out, everybody wants to see uh, what they are doing with corporate social responsibility and how they are performing with environmental practices. And uh, this should be done through transparency. Everybody should be able to see uh, what kind of rules are imposed and how things can be set up. Um, there's no mention of that. 
Uh, and then there's, you mentioned labeling briefly, but not enough. And that is a way for us to really get the corporate social responsibility initiative to the consumers. And uh, you know, when uh, people like us are buying something in a supermarket, we want to see where this product is coming from, how it's being shipped, how it's being developed, how it's being produced. Um, and this can be attributed to you know, supermarkets, to things like Best Buy, electronic companies, and we get to track down where these uh, products are coming from. And if people are okay with investing a little bit more on a product that is uh, based on fair trade or based on uh, organic sustainable growth or uh, you know, you know, dealing with labor conditions or any of these things, then maybe you will see an influence on companies actually taking initiative to find a proper sustainable production method that deals with corporate social responsibility principles. Um, I have two examples. I wanted to explain them to you, but I guess I'll skip that. But basically, it's very interesting how some of these councils are organized to provide labeling methods to uh, companies like uh, Whole Foods or uh, Carrefour, and people are actually responding to that. And that leads me to my next point, which is that uh, there should be more integration of consumers in the paper, and you know, seeing how these firms reach out to consumers and how the consumers respond to that, uh, because in the end, <laughs> CSR will really have a better effect on how companies deal with uh, environmental practices and social practices when the consumers are directly involved. And um, uh, I wanted to also have a little bit more information on the uh, conclusion about how to integrate education, for example, uh, so that more people know about it and CSR is used more effectively. And uh, just <coughs> figuring out ways to promote CSR in a very, very effective manner. Uh, the conclusion just says CSR is not uh, a good alternative to dealing with the economic and environmental problems we have today. Now, questions, and I will just basically list them. I said it was a question. <laughs> no, 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 this is my criticism, but okay, the questions are related. Uh, my first question is, how does corporate social responsibility uh, correspond to the notion of fair trade? And I'm talking about the banana companies, or you know, any other primary resource uh, producer. And basically, is it the same kind of uh, conclusion where we can say fair trade is ineffective and it's just an advantage for companies to make more profits? Or uh, will it actually change the mindset of consumers, the mindset of uh, firms, and actually promote environmental, good environmental and uh, labor practice? Um, can CSR promote innovation, which means if it's imposed on the firms or the firms impose it upon themselves, will they be able to come up with innovative functions to you know, better produce their products? Uh, you know, have new methods of productivity that um, workers could use that is safer but also, you know, more productive. And uh, basically, how does CSR affect local and regional businesses? And I know you focus on multinational firms in your paper, and that's, of course, the main question at stake, but local businesses probably could take advantage of the notion of CSR, and, you know, they can... I know that with local businesses, there's a lot more regulation with the worker conditions, with the production, with the fruit itself, the land, <coughs> and I think it would be very interesting to know how local businesses respond to that. Uh, labeling, is it effective? Uh, will it be able to support local businesses with a higher price tag? Uh, how will consumers respond to that? Um, and this is an interesting question, actually. With these principles that are set on the company level, what happens when a firm breaks these principles or rules? How do the other firms respond? What does a firm do? Um, it would be interesting to see how effective the sanctioning could be, because then CSR would obviously become a more effective tool. Um, and in terms of defining the enterprise, you say that the enterprise doesn't have necessarily a legal definition in your paper, and that's interesting, actually, because if it were to have a legal definition, maybe CSR could be a much more effective tool, again, uh, because then we could define it in a way so that they are more responsible, they have more accountability towards their uh, actions and production methods. So that's an interesting question. And uh, could you give us an example of uh, a multinational firm operating under the constructive principles at the company level? Um, basically, what is the, uh, the scenario tied to uh, suppliers? What is the labor situation going on with these suppliers? Uh, has there been any positive or negative environmental impact with these uh, principles set? And perhaps also on the quality of the product? It would be interesting to see a, a case study. Basta. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, you can decide if we take first another round of questions or if oh. we want to add to the first two there. Oh, yeah.
Yeah, okay, I so. have just uh, <laughs> seven <laughs> questions, seven criticism, uh, just five hours to, uh, to respond. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so who, go. how many people do have a question now? I think there's a lot. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's a good idea to, to hear you. Yeah, maybe, okay, just to see, <laughs> because then we can move to the questions. Okay, so Jana and Okay, and then... Okay, Me? And then we do a second. Okay. Raise your hands high. So, okay, now Jana and the group, and then you will Okay, my question is, what is the share of the budget that this company normally spend for corporate social responsibility, like for charity and all the things? And the <coughs> second question, you mentioned that uh, France embedded <coughs> this on the legal basis. Mm -hmm. So what are the, actually the process of like, um, imposing penalties? And if it's like, for example, the company, let's say, use um, children labor force in China, can be actually this kind of uh, affected in France by on the legal basis again. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Professor. Um, even though Alexandra has almost criticized everything, but anyway, I have a question. So um, I'm wondering if the, the, the answer to your main question is yes or no. Does CSR lead to sustainable development or not? Because I couldn't see the answer. I could not see the conclusion in the presentation <laughs> or there as either. You ain't gonna be serious <laughs> response of yes or no. <laughs> no, in that sense, I think the impression that I would get is that no, because you've painted a very blurry picture of CSR. And I, I don't think personally it's a very important tool, but in that case, do you think it's not high time that firms be forced to adopt sustainable practices <laughs> and uh, you know, to ensure sustainable development. And uh, I mean, I think so, I'm somebody who thinks that it's really important at this stage now. And you mentioned that um, there are a lot of employees, um, how complicated the whole concept of sustainable development is, can be confusing to the firm, etc. But I'm thinking there are thousands of employees, I mean, talking about really, really technical things. If you can just hire a little team that ensures that, uh, I don't think it's a very, um, you know, uh, a point that's forceful enough to say that, okay, CSR uh, is not really, you know, something that can be used for sustainable development. I mean, I do not agree with that. Even if you hire one person, hire me, anyway. But I you can really, you know, ensure that kind of thing. Thank you. Okay, I also have a question which connects to this a bit because, okay, I mean, I agree that ideally we would want to impose these uh, new standards on companies, but for a number of different reasons and factors, this is probably <coughs> not going to happen. But you mentioned in your uh, presentation that uh, like the CSR benefits the image of the firm without really entailing any liability, and you made the example SST Electronics, which started the com this campaign, and then the resources for keeping on the CSR practice finished, and they stopped the campaign. So do you think it could be viable, and especially could we have applicate this rule that when a firm starts a CSR campaign, it's actually legally binded to stick to that campaign for a certain period of time. So if you want to look good and uh, not dump waste uh, in a certain lake and get the benefits of that marketing move, you need to do it for at least five, ten, e ten years. <laughs> uh, how long? Um, maybe 15 minutes and then we have 10 minutes. Okay. So, thank you. Great. Um, first, there is a lot of PhD possible on CSR. I know. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, it's finished. <laughs> um, so, thank you. Um, a <laughs> lot, lot, a lot of questions. My, my principal um, topic, um, for an economist, one idea, one paper. So, I have a big idea, and I can. <laughs> it's impossible to deal with all of the not details, but uh, all of the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not quite easy. My topic is quite ambitious on the theoretical um, point of view 
and I, I, I with uh, Catherine Boyer, um, try to, uh, to stress uh, a framework. It's my topic, a framework, and quite um, uneasy and um, uh, uh, topic is a regulationist point of view, mm -hmm. with an historical perspective, with a variety of capitalism, with a transformation of institution. So my purpose, my purpose is quite theoretical. Um, I know all of your questions really, really important. Um, but when I uh, when I wrote this paper and then when, when I present in, in the here or there, my purpose my purpose is to to to. Uh, to deal with uh, a framework, um, how to, uh, to to deal with CSR? What is this notion? Is this concept or not a concept? I agree with you. My question, the first question, do CSR produce sustainable development? Is too huge. It's, too f it's a provocation. So, so there is no response. No one can say yes or no. Even me. <laughs> um, the purpose is. To uh, to uh, develop some research to see how CSA sometimes for some part leads to something which could deal with a part a part a little part of uh, sustainable development. Of course, the question is too huge. It's for me, it's maybe uh, or a joke or a provocation. But uh, a serious joke or a serious provocation, because uh, firms, uh, firms, uh, e uh, European Union, uh, ISO 26000, say CSR deals with uh, sustainability development. So I say, oh, okay, tell me now. The, it's the first first ID, the first uh, the first big response to 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 your question. Um, Okay, a, a framework. Um, a point uh, about the wedge d uh, watchdog. Um, it's a good question and about uh, the uh, the role of NGOs. Uh, you're right. Uh, I could uh, I could develop about NGOs. Um, uh, Corinne Gendron uh, work on NGOs. Uh, a lot of colleagues work on NGOs. We are um, a collective thinker. I produce framework, not the, not the, not the, uh, all the, all the, um, uh, um, so, <coughs> watchdog and NGO. You are right, it's a major topic. Uh, and the major topic, I think the, the question is, what kind of actors? What are their roles and what are their institutional power? I uh, in the paper that for uh, multinational and that for NGO. Okay, but the reality of power is that for multinational and that for NGOs. You're right. Sometimes NGO had great power. And it's very, very, very important. Uh, they do wonderful work, uh, like Greenpeace, like China Labor Watch, like Corp Watch, like Amnesty International. Uh, a lot, a lot of them. They go to see what uh, what is the working condition. It's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But they. The reality of power inside the production, yes, I am speaking about production. I agree with that. Uh, but it's, it's quite important. Uh, production and repartition and uh, externalities, not only production. Externalities, uh, pollution, uh, social externalities, uh, waste, uh, and, so, and so on. Okay. Um, look, I try to deal with that. That is a uh, a very important topic, so I couldn't develop on each 
topics uh, because of my own uh, uh, working abilities, uh, my time uh, and so on. So I have to deal with someone working on the code of conduct and I say thank you for your work, it's very useful for me. Um, so, so I read uh, colleagues, uh, so we are working like that, it's a, a community um, uh, working on CSR. But the power of NGO is quite, uh, quite weak and I think it's very interesting to, to have a comparison among unions <coughs> and NGOs and uh, the institutionalization of NGO uh, is quite different when you uh, compare with the institutionalization of unions. So um, I say it's very important, but they are weak. They, they could not be inside the firms. Unions are inside the firm. Not the great unions, but the workers who could be affiliated to a unions are inside the firm. They are the firms. NG NGO are not the firms. You know, the, the, the point is the definition of what is a firm. Workers are not stakeholders. Uh, some managers say, well, stakeholders, the workers, the NGO, uh, the public uh, actors. No. Workers are the firms, and NGO are not the firm in the same uh, structural definition, you know? No, I am not saying that NGO have no roles, but uh, from a structural point of view, uh, they are quite different, you know? Um, about the uh, term, alors, uh, how long? Eight minutes. Eight minutes, great. Um, Qu'est-ce que je vais dire maintenant euh, Alors, euh, about fair trade. About fair trade and about uh, consumer. Because it's not the same topic, but quite. Um, I have a slide on quality convention, but your friend uh, is quite... Uh, 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 she do what she have to do. Um, so, what I, um, my idea is that uh, there is something uh, we call quality convention. Um, you know the economics of convention? Uh, Olivier Favreau and so on? No. Uh, there is a, a French, uh, French theory, it's quite developed, there is regulationist, you know. Uh, me <laughs> and some others. And, um, there is a colleague who is working on convention. And the convention is um, uh, um, an institutional process which produces some form of agreements about work, about uh, quality, about consummation, uh, and so on. And the, the, the topic is how institution, uh, institution are produced, what struggle, what conflict, and what are the conventions which stabilize, stabilize, stab stabilize the, the conflict. My purpose about uh, consumption, consumption is that um, there is some products which are labelized. There are some products with norm, with label, with turn mark. And it's a very important phenomenon about consumption and about the rules <coughs> which define the quality, the good quality on an uh, ecological uh, point of view or an uh, uh, ethical point of view and so on. So, uh, and uh, what we have to deal with is, is the, um, the process of emerging on stabilization and confidence on uh, that convention. And that convention could be, could work if the production of this convention and the uh, uh, consumption meet themselves. And uh, the topic is uh, uh, what is the. Um, uh, consumption. Uh, consumption power, thank you. Uh, what is the consumption power? In the, at the macroeconomic level, 
the topic is uh, the, the, the wages are uh, so weak all nearly all over the world. I don't speak uh, like I speak 80, but you know that. So for a good uh, quality dimension with uh, responsibility along the um, global, uh, the global uh, value chain, um, uh, uh, with responsibility about environment, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's, it's very, uh, uh, it's not uncost, you know? Yeah. So, uh, you deal with a consumer, a consumer uh, buy something, buy something, oh, Oh, I buy some coffee from Max Avla. Oh, great. And after, I buy nothing uh, come from nowhere because uh, I just have to deal with my, uh, my wallet. You know? So uh, it's not quite easy. We could see a lot of quality convention emerging. But the stabilization of a, a major quality convention, you know, a quality con to convention, uh, that could be uh, seen as the convention for not all over the world, but for Europe or for France or for uh, or for uh, middle class. Or it's not not quite easy because of the uh, wage labor nexus and the repartition of uh, wages. So uh, yes, it's a major topic, but these conventions are in competition. And uh, the confidence on the, these, uh, these labels uh, need times uh, and so on. But it's quite uh, an excellent topic. Uh, uh, one point about um, my focusing on uh, global value chain. Ask Corinne Vercher. Before reading Co <laughs> Corinne, uh, I spoke about firms. Uh, and some of the colleagues tell me, Ah, uh, firms, you know, there is not just firms, but the for the who produce the, um, uh, the um, intermediary co consumption of firms. And you have to deal with all the components of the chain. So sometimes I, I spoke on about big firms, like uh, just a concept. And Big firms uh, are a very complicated, complex notion. And there is inside the firm, outside the firm, what, uh, with which uh, power relation. Uh, so sometimes you could just deal with the firm, because there, there is some very integrated fir firms. But in the major cases, you have to deal with their, um, with their uh, subcontractors uh, on the chain. So sometimes you can, you can say f big firms or you can say uh, global value chain. But uh, it's not the same. But um, I, I have to deal with, with reality on the material uh, organization of production. And there is there are a huge transformation of firms for the 20 last years. And the uh, global value chain seems to be a very good concept to, uh, to catch the transformation of the firm, the firm as a network. I, can, I could say the firm as a network. And when I say the firm as a network, I, I am nearly with the same notion of uh, global chain value. You see? Um, so, voilà. Uh, Qu'est-ce que j'avais euh, encore quelques minutes Comme vous voulez. As you want. J'ai pas de... Ça a lot to, to say. So, Mabrouk, you want to re-emphasize your question? I, okay, I'll reframe them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wasn't really clear. Um, no, I was just saying, okay, uh, in the end, what's the conclusion of your paper? Does CSR lead to corporate, uh, leads to sustainable development or not? I, I, I respond to you. I, resp I, I tell you. I tell you, my question is a provocation or a joke. I will not respond, not to you, but to 
to this question. This question is a, is a question of a, a research, is a, is a question to, to develop work, to, uh, to, to work, to understand what is CSR, not to say yes or no. But I know you want, I see in you, I, you, you want a, 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 a response. The response is, is CSR contribute to uh, sustainable development? Yes, but very weakly. <laughs> no, you know, um, sustainable development is an idea, a principle, a dream, or something like that. Um, mode of regulation is a concept which have one idea is to um, define what are the main organization of uh, economical system. We just could talk about uh, speak about um, mode of regulation uh, ex post. Nowadays, CSR had not lead to sustainable development. If you want just one wave spoon. So, so in that case, just no, so we <laughs> Good point. Well, in that case, why do you think that it was a crucial question? That okay, let's go for the crucial. Sorry. Why do you think it was a crucial question in the sense that it seems like CSR is one thing with motives, uh, different motives compared to what sustainable development is, which is probably uh, more focusing on a company's production, for example, you know, if they are using uh, sustainable techniques or not. But so why do you think that, why did you even frame the question that way? I framed the question because uh, we are in the neoliberal world which quite inequality, which quite pollution, quite uh, negative externalities. And we, as people, have to deal with utopia, with to, uh, uh, a collective project. And sustainable development could be one of these projects to transform the society. We could just be cynical and say, uh, <coughs> Okay, I just want my money back, I want for my wallet, and so on. But we are not quite cynical. Not you, you, you or me. Uh, a human being needs some uh, utopia and some uh, value, uh, political uh, ideas. And sustainable development is one of these very huge and quite fuzzy ideas. So it's quite important to ask the firms to ask the... Um, uh, uh, politician to ask uh, the trade unionist, what do you do to go to the very long uh, track to sustainable development? And what my response is nowadays, no, but uh, CSR do not produce nothing. CSR produce institutional change. It's very important. NGO is are now uh, stakeholder with power, uh, uh, they could catch the media, catch the opinion, and it's, it's very important. It is not a big step to the equality or the social justice, it's small steps. And the response is, I, wor I am working on CSR because uh, the way is very long, but there is small steps to sustainable development, I don't know, but to some social progress. Okay. Gary. Yeah. Okay, I have uh, two questions because in the first, I think it's nice that you re-emphasize now that it's actually this institutional change that uh, CSR does. Because at first I was thinking, okay, if I see, because the impression I always had when I was working in companies, okay, there's CSR and we can do it, but at the end it's a, we have to communicate it anyway and to transform it to the public. So do we spend our budget on changing really something and communicating or just communicating? So usually then it's only the communication because also for many sectors that are actually really important, it's mainly rep reputation that is important. So it's not really the product or the product quality, but it's their reputation. And I'm especially thinking about the financial sector, who's mainly built on, on that kind of thing. So they say like, yeah, we've changed something, we're different now, we're more sustainable, but then they just go on with practice as usual. Um, and 
the second thing is this, because then I was thinking, okay, if you said that social corporate, res no, yeah, corporate social responsibility works if uh, the consumers actually respond to the convention. Um, but I think only to rely on consumers, maybe actually financial institutions can play a role because when they give out loans and when they give out credit, <coughs> they don't do it on the criteria of that the firm who they give the money to actually is sustainable or is doing something different in their business schedule. So like them as intermediaries, shouldn't we kind of somehow force them or, or I don't know, do something that they actually also ask companies to be like that and that the demand doesn't only come from consumers? Um, for the first point, um, it's a great question. Uh, it's a great question. I, I begin to work in s uh, about CSR in 19, uh, no, I, I don't, that you doesn't care, uh, 10 years ago. Um, and the first work I, I develop is about com communication. I'm working with um, social sci scientists, working on media, on uh, uh, communication inside firms, and um, what we saw in 10 years ago is that uh, CSR is just a question of communication. And you, 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 you deal with it. Um, do we have to change uh, our communication on that topic, or do, you wa do we have to change the reality? It was a major difficulty about accountability. My, my idea is, uh, in the first stage, uh, firms work on communication as a defensive response, as you know. And, but to produce information, you could say uh, what you, whatever you want, but sometimes uh, a consumer or media say, you understand in English? Uh, what? What the fuck? Because uh, you, you, could, you could, it's my English. Uh, so communication, and after what's Inside the communication, second steps, reporting. Hmm, it's not as easy to report or to communicate. Reporting, you have to produce information, you have to uh, uh, produce uh, numbers, and to produce numbers about uh, women and men equality, or about, uh, I don't know, you have, to, you have to produce that. And the difficulty of uh, external stakeholder is access to information. Union are inside. Union are not inside the top management, <coughs> but they are inside the firm. NGO are outside, so they have to deal with um, uh, hiding, seeking, catching information. It's extremely delicate. And the point is that information do not exist, information have to be built. Uh, information is not, it's not just data. It's just, it's building an, uh, knowledge about CSR, and the firms is the first players <laughs> to build this knowledge. And uh, one other point, very important, is that inside the firms, all the players are quite different. Uh, when you uh, when you meet some uh, some uh, workers inside the department of CSR, very good guys are working. They believe and and uh, about the, the work. They try to to change the world. I spoke with the department of uh, CSR of Total, Total uh, you, uh, Oil Company, uh, one of the worst company. Uh, in France, uh, and the, the, the department said, uh, we try to, it's very difficult, you know, what is the culture of Total, and uh, uh, don't, don't criticize us, they, they said me that, don't criticize us, we do what we can. Uh, I, I say, oh, yes, yes, but, but you can, uh, you can, uh, very weak, uh, you are very weak, and they say, yes, we are weak, but we are working on that, and it's uh, quite difficult, what, what, we, what, what we have to say? It's just communication, or yes, you, you try, or you are quite cynical, or you are stupid, or uh, you are embedded. Uh, yes, they are embedded, like, quite. Um, so, 
you, we have to watch at the, at the uh, struggle inside the firms, inside the uh, wide range of uh, actors uh, uh, and players. Uh, on transparency, yes, yeah. not transparent. Yes, yes, absolutely. You're right. You're right. Um, Oh, after uh, one sentence, another sentence. Uh, no, I have to do <laughs> as you want. Uh. Okay, no, let's take five more minutes. My question was, did it change actually something that it was legalized in France? Ah, in France. In France. Um, two laws in France. Uh, one law in uh, 2001. Uh, Corinne and moi, the deuxième law, c'est quand? La deuxième loi, euh, la, la loi NRE et la, la dernière loi, euh, l'article 225 de la loi NRE, c'est quand Ouais, c'est 2012. Uh, 2012. <laughs> um, the first law in uh, 2001, um, which its name is New Regulation of uh, Enterprise, um, obligation of reporting. The reporting is not voluntary, but there is an obligation of reporting. But you, you can say what, whatever you want. So some NGOs uh, work to um, read the, the social report and say on the on note, have a notation about the report. It's the first step. Very very uh, weak state, very uh, small state. Uh, second uh, law in France, um, to no, it's uh, the Grenelle de l'environnement, and uh, it's very funny. There is a, je uh, uh, décret. In France, there is a decree, a decree, okay, a decree, and uh, three. Three, three years to produce the, de the decree about the, um, uh, the article on CSR. Because there has there have been a, a huge struggle uh, between uh, big firms, the MEDEF, the Union of, uh, uh, of uh, Firms, um, and the uh, state and the other uh, stakeholder to define the new rules and the new rules say uh, obligation of reporting, obligation of producing uh, the data print. C'est comme ça qu'on dit l'empreinte euh, écologique. The footprint. The footprint, pardon. Um, and to develop uh, an external control about the report. So, you see, one step, another step, and now there are obligations on reporting and external control. And the discussion in France is uh, for which firms, because we, we are speaking with uh, um, about uh, big firms and uh, what about the small firms? Local you, it's businesses. Local businesses. I can uh, local business. Uh, uh, local businesses is, is really really different. Um, locally. You can have, uh, you can have uh, uh, the better or the worst. You can have slave and uh, whatever you want. But you can have a uh, responsibility with the, the community. What, uh, what we could say uh, in France and in Europe and I think uh, in North America is for the small firm, uh, the fact that the workers, the manager, the owner, are in the same, uh, not, not really for America, just Europe and France, uh, are in the same uh, country, in the same town. Um, the responsibility, um, uh, the social responsibility, the ecological responsibility are quite different. Uh, at the local level, you have a uh, political institution, you have a uh, union institution, and you have a lot of um, micro institution uh, where there are some, uh, some debate, some compromise, and uh, 
we used to say that small business are uh, uh, responsible by, um, by the size and by the localization of the, of the people. There, there's not, there is no gap, gap uh, between the, uh, where you live and your, where you work and where your decision produces something. But there, there, there is topic about small business, but quite different. If nearly all the literature about CSR uh, deal with big, big firms. <coughs> CSR have been produced by big firms from them for the legitimation. Small business do not need really CSR. They need to be legitimate, but not with the uh, tools of CSR. Well, my point is that I think that it's easier for local businesses to adopt strategies of better environmental practice or better social practice just because they have this sort of capacity to connect with the community and yes, organize. Yes, but they are dominated on the market. So, is it useful to say that? When, when they are dominated by the competition. So, we deal with the big firms because big firms create the market, the institution, um, create the, 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 the standard de facto. Yes, local firms could do good things, but they are weak and they are dominated. But for example, what about the firms that like, uh, like sell their product maybe in markets and then like a number of firms like mobilize to compete against Monopoly, even though each product of a local firm is from a different uh, location and then Monopoly is essentially... Yeah, yeah. Oh. I am agree, CSR can produce good transformation with uh, proximity, um, um, short circuit. Short, short circuit? Uh, <laughs> short circuit. Could Ben Dan could not small compi competing firms be maybe the watchdog for like bigger firms? Ah, what about the watchdog? <laughs> And are small the question is, are small firms can be watchdogs? No. Uh, in the literacy, uh, invisible hand and so on, a watchdog. No, I, I, not really. I think not really um, in, in the... If I, um, if I take my framework, institutional <laughs> CSR and the strategic CSR, I think uh, small firms uh, are innovative. Um, could be something as a watchdog, but not a watchdog, innovation dog. And uh, big firms work with mimetism. They will buy small firms or they will copy small firms. And so, I am agree with you. Uh, uh, with the label, uh, the ecological label or social label, it begins with small firms on, on NGOs. And uh, what does capitalism? They Catch the good idea. It's exactly what Chapello and Boltonsky says in the New Spirit of Capitalism, the book uh, I spoke about. Uh, they said the capitalism is able to, um, to catch its criticism. Criticism by uh, inside the market, by uh, small firms, and criticism by uh, NGOs. It's a, a major power. Uh, uh, of, uh, of the big firm, of the capitalism, to, uh, to catch all the good ideas um, for themselves and uh, rebuild something which is sometimes very far from the original, but with the idea of label. And now all the great firms are, have uh, a lot of labels, so uh, the consumer could say, what is a label? There is 10 labels in the I, I, I cannot understand that, so, oh, I take the less expensive. The powerful of the price competition uh, is unbelievable to uh, transform the labelization uh, strategies. Merci à vous.